Hello and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history. This podcast is designed for you to learn things about London that most Londoners don't even know, all in 20 minutes. I am your host, Hazel Baker, a qualified London tour guide and CEO of londonguidedwalks.co.uk. There's so much we can't fit into our London walking tours, no matter how hard we try. And so this podcast is where we can get down and dirty with the detail. You're not going to find this level of detail in any London guidebook. If you like what you hear, then rate and review this podcast. It's really very much appreciated. And as usual, show notes can be found on our website, londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast. Get that cup of tea, put your feet up and enjoy. Joining me in the studio today is City of London tour guide Ian McDermott. Hello. Hello. All right, so today we are going to be talking about something that is rather important, but a little bit maybe underestimated. This is the Survey of London by John Stowe. And anybody looking at any of London's history is bound to have come across this at some point or another. But today we're going to be discussing the importance of the survey itself and also getting to know John Stowe. Is that the plan? That is the plan. I reckon that this is about the most quoted book on London. But I was a little bit apprehensive saying that in case you thought I was rather out of touch with modern life, maybe. No, I don't think so. I mean, I haven't read every book about London, but he's always there, isn't he? Yeah, he does get a mention a lot and hence his importance for us. For those listeners who haven't the foggiest about what we're going on about, what is a survey of London? Right, well, it was written in 1598 and then it's republished in an expanded form in 1603. It is a choreographical survey of London. Now, choreographical means that it is map-like. And this is partly why it's so important, because he does a very detailed map-like survey of London. And this would be a great source at any time for any city, but of course it has particular importance because the London that he was writing about would be largely destroyed in the Great Fire of 1666 and then further damage caused by Victorian town development, further damage caused by bombing in the Second World War. We've got this great record And the structure of it is is very, very logical. So he begins with the origins of London. He then goes on to describe the common parts of London. So he's got chapters on the rivers, beginning with the Thames, obviously, the wells, the bridges. He goes on to the walls, the gates. He has a little bit on the customs of London, the great men of London and what they've done. And then you get on to the core of the book, which is a description of London's wards. Now, there were 26 wards in the time of John Stowe, and the wards are the lay, i.e. non-religious equivalent of the parishes. So London's divided into parishes and it's divided into wards. And the wards are the kind of administrative units. They're the bits of London that are responsible for taxation, administration and governance. So the the wards have their own administration, they have their own assemblies called ward moats and they select members who sit on common council which is the big council responsible for all of London and they select, each ward selects an alderman. And why is a survey of London so important? Well, to give a couple of examples of this, of his descriptions, there are so many in the book, but just two that spring to mind are his uh, description of Bridge House, which is on the south bank of the Thames, sorry, it was on the south bank of the Thames, and was a big warehouse for the repair of London Bridge. So all these materials were stored there, and they also had ovens to help in case of times of scarcity. And it's that kind of detail that uh, is just so interesting about the book. And another good example is precinct of St Paul's Cathedral. Now, the precinct of St Paul's Cathedral is the is the largest in London. And we've got this great description from Stowe of all the things that were occurring in there. So he describes there's a couple of towers, there's a parish church, there are chapels in there, there's the dean's house, and he provides a rather fascinating description of the Bishop's Palace because he says that the Bishop's Palace, which is also in, within this precinct, he describes it as being the grandest palace 
in London. And then he says that when Richard II and his wife come to stay in the city, this is the natural place to, to put them up at. And he also describes the brew house and the bake house for the, for the people attached to the cathedral just to the south of it. So it, it's a really detailed description of life in London before the Great Fire. And of course, this is a time way before photography. So looking at that detail, that's something that you can't get in the Agar map, isn't it? Or the pictures that we have of the time. Yes, that's right. That's quite significant because what Stowe is doing is roughly contemporary with a great expansion in map making. And map making relies on the use of to be able to, to map things accurately. And it's in the 1570s that we get the uh, Saxon maps of the English counties, these maps of London that we're beginning to get. So people have been able to visualise uh, space in a new way. And Stowe's book is in many ways putting down in words the, the, this new way of looking at space. So could it be considered as being a guidebook? Uh, yes, it is, because it is a, a guide uh, around the city, because, as I said, he takes you through ward by ward, and he gives you very great detail. The beginning of each chapter is uh, basically him walking you through in print the boundaries of the ward. And another thing that he does is that he, when he mentions a big church, he'll list all the, the monuments in it. So, it's, I mean, it's a fantastic source for anybody wanting to go into this and actually find what was physically there. So we might as well get into John Stowe himself. So who was he? Yeah, well, we can give his dates. So he's 1525 to 1605. Now, you normally give somebody's dates and it's just kind of a rather bland fact about them. But this is so important for John Stowe for, for two reasons. One, you can tell from those dates that he was an old man when he died. He was 80, and I, I'm talking in 16th century That's terms. That's really so. good going, isn't it? Yeah, so, I mean, if you... Once you'd got past sort of childhood diseases and the teenage years, you, you were sort of fairly well set in terms of life expectancy. You could expect to live to your 50s. Uh, so to be able to go to go beyond that, to be 80 when, when you actually die, is, is quite remarkable. And this is important because he's, he's looking back onto the past and he's writing about the past. He's writing about a kind of rapidly... So in, to some extent, he's writing about a rapidly vanishing past. And it's also important because he lived through some very tumultuous years. So he lives through the break with Rome under Henry VIII and the dissolution of the monasteries. He lives through the radical implementation of Protestantism under Henry's son, Edward VI. He lives through the restoration of Catholicism under Mary, and then the pendulum swings back under Elizabeth to Protestantism again, though not quite so radical as under her, her brother, Edward VI. So, I mean, it's a period of, of a great change, and it, it's very interesting that he has this long life living through all of this and seeking to record a lot of it. And what was his profession? Well, that's quite a good question because, uh, well, first of all, his father was a tallow chandler and then he is a merchant tailor. So he was apprenticed as a, as a tailor and he, he's made free. He's made a, a full member of the company later on. And he pursues this career. We don't have a great deal of detail, but he, he looks as though he gives up the tailoring at the age of about 40 and then to pursue his what we would call academic interests. But we don't have a great deal of biographical detail on him, and we don't have a great deal of information on how he actually made his money. The indications are that he was always a bit short of money. He didn't own a horse. Uh, he went pretty much everywhere on foot. But it could well be that some people's views of him of living in, in real poverty have been exaggerated. Uh, at the very end of his life, he gets a licence from King James I of England to beg. And some people have thought this is evidence of him being reduced to absolute penury. But on the other hand, it's the kind of thing John Stowe would like to collect as a document. So I'm not sure on that. And we know that he had a pension from the merchant tailors at this stage. He does get payments for, for his books. And his widow is able to put up quite a nice monument to him. And his monument is quite well known. It's in St Andrew undershaft which isn't always very easy to get into but inside there there's this fine terracotta bust of him and this bust is quite well known because there's a ceremony every two years whereby the the merchant tailors as they are now they replace the the, the pen in his in his bust so what else can you tell us about john stowe he 
Well, he, he gets into print. He launches an edition of Chaucer in 1561, and his next publications are he publishes a, a summary of English chronicles in the 1570s. And this book is enormously popular, so far as we can tell by its publishing history. So it went through seven editions and went through several abridgments. And then he expands that into his Chronicles of 1580. And then the Chronicles itself is rewritten and gets reissued, well, rewritten as his Annals, which is published in 1592. And what were his influences then? Right, well, we, we've mentioned two of them. The first being map making. So we were saying that the, the, the book, the survey, is a bit like map making done, done in print. We've also mentioned the Chronicles because he very much maintains the tradition of the chronicle. You can feel the influence of it in the survey and that the survey is full of lists and, and things. And he, yes, it's, it's done in rather a traditional uh, mode. And an important, another important influence on him is antiquarianism. So antiquarianism gets going really in the 16th century. And antiquarianism is an interest in documents and monuments and establishing the importance of a historical object or document and establishing its veracity. And one of the most early things that Stowe does is he's associated with the uh, circle of Matthew Parker. Now, Parker is Archbishop of Canterbury, and he's very interested in the medieval past because he this fits in with his idea of Protestantism, of the, the, the reformed English church having its roots in the Middle Ages. So he's very interested in, 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 in reading medieval manuscripts to try and back up this view and he employs Stowe as a collector and an editor of manuscripts. Also there is the beginnings of a movement within English antiquarianism to write an antiquarian survey of the whole of England and Wales and the, the, the beginning of this project is associated with a man named John Leyland who doesn't get very far with it, he, he suffers some kind of mental collapse. But other people pick up the, the gaunt of doing this and the first bit that actually makes its way into print is a perambulation of Kent by William Lambard which comes out in the 1570s and uh, Lambard incidentally the, if you go to Greenwich and come out of the the station opposite you is a college called Queen Elizabeth's College which yeah. is almshouses. It's oh, beautiful there. It is beautiful. Those are the rebuilt almshouses that he founded, William Lambard founded oh. in, the, in the 16th century. But anyway, so Lambard produces his perambulation of Kent and there are others as well. So there are a county, a man named Norden comes out into print with a book called Speculum Britanniae and he manages to write about Middlesex and Hertfordshire and the idea with both Norden and Lambard is that they're going to go on and write about hopefully all of the counties, and they stop. So Lambard stops after one county, Norden stops after two. And there's another very influential book, William Camden's uh, Britannia, which is published in 1586. And this very much fits into the antiquarian tradition. Uh, but Camden is primarily interested in, in Britain as a province of the, the Roman Empire. So all of these things are impacting on uh, Stowe. And the way I was describing the, the, the book earlier on, was that it was this choreographical survey, so it's written like a map. But he stitches onto the top of this this map-like structure uh, a lot of historical information, and it's that historical information which I think makes it a, an interesting read for us. And he's got quite an interesting writing style as well, hasn't he? Yes. So I've mentioned that he, he does rather go in for lists and he does rather go in for giving you sort of the, the, the ward boundaries. But the, the real interest, I think, for people reading it today is the, the vivid detail that, that he will give. And perhaps I could give a couple of examples of, uh, of this to get, get a, f a flavour of the book. Yeah. One which um, I find, which, which always stuck in my mind, is a story. Is, is he's writing about the Walbrook. Now, the Walbrook is one of the tributaries of the Thames that has disappeared. But it used to, the, the modern street Walbrook, which runs north to south, marks out the eastern bank of the, this river. It then pursue, pursued a course down what is now Dowgate Hill and then finally down Cousin Lane and into the Thames. And Cousin Lane and Dowgate Hill, for people to locate themselves, are just on the side of Cannon Street Station. Now, one thing that strikes me walking around London, which I, I just forget, and I'm sure other people do forget, is quite how hilly it is. And you mm. really get a sense of that if you walk up uh, Dowgate Hill. Well, Stowe provides a description of these and he says that the upper part of the Walbrook, i.e. down to where Walbrook, the, the, the modern street Walbrook ends, was covered over and then the Walbrook was open. 
and Dowgate Street was Downgate Street. And he describes a, an 18 year old trying to leap over the Walbrook just where it becomes uncovered, i.e., where the modern Dowgate Hill begins. He loses his footing and he's carried away by the current. And men try to rescue him by putting staves into the water, but they're unable to. And he's finally found uh, bashed against a cartwheel, which I think was probably serving as part of the water gate down the bottom. Now, this is a dramatic story. It's uh, obviously an un unhappy one. But what it shows us, which is so important, is how strong and how rapidly flowing the Warbrook was at the time of Stowe, at the 16th century. So after all these centuries of encroachment onto this Warbrook, of the being silted up, the banks being encroached on, it's still sufficiently strong to carry a young man away in Stowe's time. And then I think the thing that stands in my mind the most, my favourite part of the book really, is his story about Thomas Cromwell. Cromwell was given two messages, that's properties, within Austin Friars, and he built himself a house there. And Stowe describes how one day people who were living a little bit away from this found that their garden boundaries had been removed. So Cromwell's men go in and they just extend his garden by 22 feet. And one of the gardens affected is that of John Stowe's father. And not only does John Stowe's father find a great big wall built 22 foot into his garden, but they've also up to summer house he had and push that back and Stowe goes on to relate the fact that his father still had to pay the same rent for the property and he ends it with some rather nice comments along the lines of I think that great men do sometimes forget themselves hmm. so yeah so he's very good on the on this vivid detail and I think one other thing about this is that you get a picture of one thing that Stowe does is he very much regrets a lot of the changes that are occurring to London he regrets the defacement of the monuments and this has led a lot of people to suspect that he might have been a, a crypto-Catholic, and indeed he gets into trouble. Uh, he gets into trouble with the church authorities who make uh, a search of his house. So one of the bishops of London is Grindle, who later goes on to be Archbishop of Canterbury, and he's a noted Puritan. He's committed to reform, and he sends his chaplains around and they search uh, Stowe's house, and they find what they describe as Romish material. And it's a bit of an open question, really. Does Stowe have this material simply because he's an antiquarian and he's interested in collecting all kinds of material, or is he actually sympathetic to the, the, the religion that's been, being persecuted? Interesting what you're saying about him not starting writing, really, until he retired when he was 40 years old. So maybe he was feeling that he needed to preserve what he could see was rapidly disappearing by writing it down. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's a, a large element of that. And we can also talk about the things that Stowe likes about London in addition to the old monuments. He's very much in favour of collective responsibility. He very much admires people who do things for the collective good. So I was saying that towards the beginning, uh, he has this list of Londoners who have made great benefactions to the city, including Whittington, who is stupendously wealthy and does a lot of benefactions. Yeah, that's Dick Whittington. Yeah, and also in his will, Whittington left a lot of money for the benefit of London. And one thing that he is very keen on mentioning throughout the, the work, which again, I think is a mod, for a modern reader is very interesting, is the conduits. So the conduits are the, the lead pipes that brought what they called sweet water, uh, what we call fresh water, into London. So these pipes carried uh, water from the wells in Clerkenwell, to, to the north of London, but also from the west, quite a long distance, Tyburn. And you can imagine that constructing these pipes, these conduits, is an enormous expense, and then getting the, the heads of the conduits where people could draw water. And he goes into great detail, wherever he comes across a conduit, he goes into great detail about its construction and the people who paid for it. Following on from this, he's very critical of things that are going wrong in London. So he doesn't like it when ditches are, uh, are filled, and there used to be lots of ditches, the, these are no longer maintained. Hound's Ditch is being built over at his time he doesn't like the fact that the open fields are being built on around London and so London is changing before him and he doesn't deal with this directly but obviously we can say that London is undergoing a huge population growth at this time and this is expressed in a lot of this building for example one of the things he bemoans is, is the loss of the fields in Whitechapel to housing so that Londoners can no longer walk over them 
One other thing that he's very proud of is London's origins. At the beginning of the book, he goes into the origins of London, and he's a bit dubious about this because this is, relies on Geoffrey of Monmouth's description, and he rather distances himself from it. He sort of leaves it hanging whether this is actually true or not. But according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, London is founded by Brutus, who is a descendant of the Trojans, and this makes a parallel between London and Rome. Stowe also quotes quite extensively from Fitzstephen, who is a 12th century writer on London. And one of the things that he quotes a couple of times is Fitzstephen saying that the, these aldermen, who are the, the senior people in each of the London wards, are the equivalent of the Roman Senate. So this is a, a huge piece of civic pride. So normally when I'm reading a survey of London, Ian, I am looking very specifically at a certain place and a particular point in time. But you actually read it from beginning to end, didn't you? Yes, and I find it very interesting. I mean, I think you have to be very motivated and very interested in London's history. But um, one thing I didn't mention is that he does all of London. I, I got up saying that he does the wards. He then goes on to do the suburbs of London. So it's a complete description of London at the time, including uh, Westminster, for example. Fantastic. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. My pleasure. And don't forget, a transcript of this and links to a Survey of London book for you to purchase can be found on our website, londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast and click on episode 44, John Stowe, A Survey of London. Mm-hmm.